שכן של קומות שלא הכרתי, נכנסת מבלי לחשב, וטיקטוק היה דמעות על הלחיים. ערב טוב לחברים בישראל. And welcome to all who are joining us from around the world. Thank you for joining us for this first installment of what we know will be an amazing three-part Judea and Samaria virtual mega event, co-hosted by Yesha Council, My Israel, and the Zionist Organization of America. I am Alan Jay, National Director of Outreach and Engagement here at the Zionist Organization of America, ZOA or ZOA, depending on from where you're joining us. We are proud at ZOA to be the loudest and clearest voice defending the Jewish state of Israel's sovereign rights, which include Judea, Samaria, the Jordan Valley, and all of Jerusalem exclusively as Israel's capital. At our recent annual ZOA gala, Prime Minister Bennett recognized ZNA, ZOA's unique status by saying, since its founding, ZOA has been a staunch defender and supporter of the state of Israel. Having friends like you allows Israel to succeed in optimal conditions, and we're truly grateful to have you on our side. Today's program is entitled Judea and Samaria, the great opportunity for the successful future of the state of Israel and the entire Middle East. Our host and moderator will be our ZOA representative in Israel, Dan Eluz. Originally from Montreal, Canada, Dan moved to Israel after finishing legal studies at McGill University specializing in international law. Dan has worked for the current and immediate past prime ministers of Israel, Naftali Bennett and Bibi Netanyahu. Dan is a former city council member of Jerusalem, has published a book on Israeli politics, and serves as an international law advisor to the IDF in reserve duty. Dan and his wife, Bat El, live in Yerushalayim. Dan, thank you for working with our partners and bringing this edu educational opportunity to our combined Yesha Council, My Israel, and ZOA audiences. Dan, the program is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody from Jerusalem, and welcome to the second annual Judea and Samaria virtual mega event. This year, we will be having a three-part series. So if you did not yet save the dates, open your calendar right now, uh, and please do so. Other than today, we will have events on February 20th and March 6th here on Zoom on Sundays at the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, which is 6 p.m. Israel time. This event is the product of a partnership between ZOA, which I represent, the Judea and Samaria Council, and My Israel. I want to start by thanking our partners, Sarah Etzni Cohen from My Israel, who we will hear very soon, and Nigal Dilmoni from the Judea and Samaria Council, will be answering questions at the end. Egal is the CEO of the Judea and Samaria Council, Yesha Council, the umbrella organization of the regional councils in Judea and Samaria. So if you have questions for him, write them throughout the night in the chat, and we will have a discussion with him in the end where I will be asking him those questions. The Judea and Samaria virtual mega event was established in order to bring you real and accurate information about what is going on in Judea and Samaria. Too often, even pro-Israel activists get false information and news, and we wanted to link you directly to what is going on in Judea and Samaria. You will quickly see that Judea and Samaria is not about war and the so-called occupation. It is much more about history, economic opportunity, and yes, even peace. Israel's sovereignty in Judea and Samaria is the key to the Jewish heritage of the state of Israel. It is the key to the further development of Israel's economy, and it is the key to regional peace. Last year's program was a great success, and we had hoped to have an in-person event this year, but Omicron actually decided otherwise. So instead, this year, we decided to up our game, and we brought you the very best speakers available on the subject. In today's program, we will focus on the opportunities that Judea and Samaria bring to us. We will have two, two MKs. First of all, the former mayor of Jerusalem, Nir Barkat, and also the former minister of regional cooperation, Ophir Akunis. We will have a member of Congress, Representative Louis Gomert. We will have a great academic and policy researcher, Dr. Yechiel Leiter. 
And as I said, a special and exclusive question and answer with the CEO of the Judea and Samaria Council. Wow, what a day awaits us. But before all of that, I truly have the great honor to introduce our first speaker today. The honor is great because we are going to hear uh, one of the great Zionist leaders of our time who dedicated his life to the state of Israel. Morton A. Klein has been the national president of the Zionist organization, ZOA, for more than 25 years and is one of the leading Jewish activists in the United States today. Mort is a child of Holocaust survivors born in a displaced persons camp in Gunzburg, Germany. Mort, Mort worked in three US administrations, working in Washington DC as an economist, as an econ, ec economist, sorry. He also worked closely with two-time Nobel laureate Linus Pauling. Mort, Mort is the most fearless and outspoken Zionist and Jewish advocate, has testified before Congress, is often quoted in the media and has appeared on, an, on any number of television and radio outlets. We are blessed and honored here at ZOA to work with one of the greatest Zionists of our time. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, ZOA National President, Mort Klein. Well, I want to thank Dan Luz for that very kind introduction for all his work in putting this together. I must also give sincere thanks to the Judea and Samaria Council, the head of uh, My Israel, Sarah Hetsy Cohen, for playing an enormous role in putting this important program together. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this great program featuring a uh, member Knesset, uh, Ophir Akunis of Likud, who's a former Minister of Labor and uh, Science and Technology, uh, uh, the distinguished former Mayor of Jerusalem, M.K. Nir Barkat, <coughs> uh, who is uh, one of the extraordinarily successful uh, high-tech entrepreneurs in Israel, uh, the distinguished Congressman Louis Gomer, my dear friend, uh, one of the most articulate and ardent defenders of, uh, of Israel in Congress. Uh, he is from Texas. And Yechiel Leiter, a brilliant orator who has served both prime ministers and uh, ministers. And I thank all of you who have joined us today uh, for this very important webinar. <laughs> this is a very important webinar. <clears throat> We're talking about the Jewish people's rights to the heart of Israel, to Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. <laughs> This is a map of the Middle East. You see the orange 22 countries, which are the Arab countries. Israel is the tiny yellow country. Israel is one eighth of 1% of the land mass of the Middle East. And yet the world is pressuring Israel to give away even more land to the Arabs. Uh, we should always be aware of that truth. <laughs> Judea and Samaria is the cradle of our long, rich biblical and Jewish history. It's part of the land that God Almighty granted to the Jewish people as an inheritance. Maps show that the 12 tribes <coughs> throughout the land of Israel, including Judea and Samaria, <laughs> uh, were uh, all over those areas. Hebron is in Judea. It's mentioned 87 times in the Bible. This is where Abraham and Sarah bought land uh, for their future burial plots. It's where David was first anointed king and first ruled for seven years. The Ark of the Covenant, uh, which is located in Shiloh, Samaria, uh, uh, we... Uh, was the center of Jewish life for almost 400 years. The Jews of Judea rose up in the Bar Kokhba revolt, during which the Jews held 50 strongholds in Judea, including uh, Bar Kokhba's headquarters at Betar. The Maccabees' base was in Betel in Samaria. Even John Adams, in 1819, the President of the United States, said he wishes the Jews again would form an independent nation in Judea, said President Adams. Judea and Samaria were within the areas designated for reconstituting the Jewish homeland under binding international law as in treaties, including the San Remo uh, Resolution, the League of Nations Covenant, the British Mandate, the Anglo-American Convention, the UN Charter, Article 80, which continues the Jewish people's rights granted under the mandate after the mandate's uh, uh, expiration. But we have serious internal and external dangers to the Jewish communities of Judea and Samaria now. Many of the internal problems stem from a governing coalition that uh, includes <coughs> the hostile to Israel, Ra'am, an Islamist movement. And the Israeli government and the civil administration are doing virtually nothing about the huge amounts of unlawful Palestinian Arab building in Area C. There's been 72,000 illegal Arab homes uh, built there, with more going up each day. The Palestinian Authority and Europeans are engaged in a deliberate, organized effort to take over the most strategic areas of Area C, which is under full Israeli administration under the Oslo Accords. And there's no legitimate need for such uh, building. 
There are vast empty spaces in the areas A and B, which the Palestinian Arabs controlled, and they're undeveloped. <laughs> Meanwhile, the civil administration is harassing, threatening, and destroying Jewish structures in Judea and Samaria and farms. This makes no sense. We also have a current U.S. administration that's engaging in an unconscionable interference and pressure on Israel not to build in Jerusalem and other parts of Judea and Samaria, while they're ignoring the massive Arab building there. For instance, on December 2nd, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken called Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett to bitterly complain and to make clear to Naftali Bennett, we, the United States, urge you to refrain from advancing settlement activity. According to the Times of Israel, Prime Minister Bennett promised that a 9,000 uh, residence area in Atarot that was going to be built will not be built. This cannot stand. The U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, also publicly condemned Israel for a settlement expansion, even though there is no settlement expansion. There's not been a single new settlement Jewish community created in Judea and Samaria since Oslo began, and there's no expansion. They're building within the existing boundaries of the existing communities. And the U.N.'s dangerous new permanent commission of inquiry seeks to criminalize Jews living in the Jewish homelands of Judea and Samaria. And three weeks ago, the new U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Thomas Nide, stated outrageously that he will not, and absolutely not, under any circumstances, visit the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. But he will cross the Green Line to meet with Mahmoud Abbas, even though the terrorist dictator Abbas is paying lifetime pensions to Arabs to murder Jews and Americans. Uh, this is simply uh, unacceptable. And how can an ambassador that refuses to visit Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria understand the realities of Israel when uh, 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 almost one million Jews live past uh, the so-called Green Line? Ambassador Nide's visit boycott uh, is a sad setback from the Trump administration. Uh, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo visited uh, the areas of Judea and Samaria, enabled joint U.S.-Israel uh, scientific and agricultural projects in Judea and Samaria. And in November 19, 20, 2019, Secretary of State Pompeo correctly concluded that, quote, after a lengthy comprehensive study, Israeli civilian communities in Judea and Samaria are legal. So what's the answer to this? We have to stand up and, and fight back. We've condemned the statements by American officials undermining Israel's rights to Judea and Samaria on TV, radio, uh, and written articles. <laughs> uh, we've also criticized the government, Israeli government's failures to stop illegal Arab housing, the destruction of and refusal to move forward with Jewish building. We need to continue the struggle to spread the truth and win the battle for the hearts and minds on campuses and Congress and in the media. We published booklets, op-eds, and many articles. A few years ago, the ZOA coalition initiated a Zain passage of resolution in the World Zionist Congress to only use the name Judea and Samaria, not the West Bank. It passed. We have to make it clear that Judea and Samaria is historic, lawful Jewish land, not occupied Palestinian territory. For God's sakes, if this was Arab land, why is it named, use a Roman name, Palestine? And the Arabs can't even pronounce the letter P because it is the Romans that captured this land in 2,000 years ago. This was never Arab land. And most importantly, <laughs> after almost 55 years of delay since Israel liberated Judea and Samaria, Israel must restore her rightful sovereignty to these lands. We've published a, a booklet of 13 reasons why Israel must do this. We've had huge billboards in Jerusalem calling for Israel to exercise her sovereignty over the Jewish people's rightful lands. International law provides for Israeli sovereignty, and we must move forward on that issue. The mandate made Britain responsible to, quote, secure the establishment of a Jewish national home and foreseeing that no Palestinian territory shall, Palestine territory, shall be ceded or leased to or in any way placed under control of the government of any foreign power. <laughs> and because UN chapter, article, Charter Article 80, continues that right, it means neither the UN nor any power in power can declare a Palestinian state on the land reserved for the Jewish people, including Judea and Samaria. <laughs> There's no law, no legal impediment preventing Israel from declaring sovereignty. UN Re Resolution 181, the so-called partition resolution, first of all, was a non-binding recommendation, but the Arabs rejected it, so it's null and void. And the partition resolution thus did not become an international binding agreement. 
Jordan's capture and 19-year illegal occupation of Judea and Samaria from 48 to 67 did not abrogate Israel's sovereignty rights. The Levi Commission, headed by the esteemed former Israeli Supreme Court Justice Levy, concluded that when Israel recaptured these lands in a defensive 67-day war, quote, the original legal status of the territory was restored, namely a territory that was designated as a national home for the Jewish people who had a right of possession to it during Jordanian rule while they were absent from the territory for several years due to a war imposed on them. They have now returned to it. It is Jewish land, concluded this commission. <laughs> Further, in 1988, Jordan publicly relinquished any claims to Judea and Samaria. King Hussein said so publicly. Uh, the 1994 Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty Recognize the Jordan River as the international boundary, thereby by admitting that Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley are within Israel. Even the PLO Charter, Article 24, says explicitly, they make no claims to Judea and Samaria or Gaza. The Oslo Accords also don't impede Israel's sovereign rights. Oslo never endorsed or even mentioned the Palestinian Arab state. And then Israel Prime Minister Rabin told the Knesset that the contemplated permanent solution will be a state of Israel that will include most of the areas of the land of Israel as it was under the rule of the British mandate, including Maladamim and Givat Ze'ev, and that Israel's borders will be beyond the lines <laughs> which existed before the Six-Day War. We will not return to the June 67 lines. He also noted that a Palestinian entity that will run Palestinian lives will be clearly less than a state. Judea and Samaria are essential to Israel's ability to defend the country. Sovereignty, which must be uh, uh, moved forward on, would provide stability, normalcy, and Israeli legal protections for the 500,000 plus Jews living in Judea and Samaria. We are called Jews because we're indigenous to Judea. We are Judeans. Jew is a contraction of the word Judea. There was never a Palestinian state here, and most of the Arabs are indigenous to Arabia, Egypt, Syria, and North America, Africa, not Judea and Samaria. <laughs> And remember, this is known as the promised land. Who promised the land and to whom did he promise it? As every Christian and Jew knows, God promised this land to the Jewish people. The Abraham Accords in, in themselves say nothing about Israeli sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. It merely delayed the clearing sovereignty when signing the Accords. Enough time has elapsed to move forward. There is no love lost between the UAE and the Palestinian Arabs. <laughs> And polls show that Israelis overwhelmingly favor sovereignty, that speculative fears have been proven baseless time and again, that a Palestinian Arab state would be a Fatah Hamas Iranian proxy terror state that endangers Israel's existence. <laughs> but in truth, the time for exercising Israel's lawful sovereignty is always right. Almost after 55 years of delay, it brought no peace by not declaring sovereignty. The Palestinian Arabs have turned down multiple offers of statehood in 37 and 48, in 2000, 2001, 2008. Their issue is not statehood. Their goal is not land. It is not statehood. It is Israel's destruction. As we see <laughs> from their own emblem, as a map of all of Israel, the shape of all of Israel, with a kafia over all of it, with a Kalishnikov rifle and Arafat. Their official emblem shows all of Israel is theirs. They're not interested in a, in a state because they will not accept it if it means accepting Israel, and they won't do it. <laughs> and veto power should not be given to the terrorist Palestinian Authority, which continues to pay terrorists to murder Jews. As ZOA wrote in 2020, sovereign nations act unilaterally to exercise their sovereign rights without giving those who seek their destruction veto power. Exercising sovereignty is actually not unilateral here because it has the backing of international law. Restoring Israeli sovereignty recognizes the truth that giving up Jewish land and rights will not bring peace and instead brings terror and war. Thank you all again for attending today. I very much look forward to hearing from my colleagues now. Thank you, Mort. You are, <coughs> sorry. Uh, for those who don't know, I, I actually am positive with COVID at home right now, but don't worry, it's not contagious through Zoom, so everything is okay. Uh, so uh, once again, thank you, Mort. You are, as always, one of the most inspiring Zionist advocates we have. You're full of values, but also, as we've seen in this lecture, uh, full of facts. Uh, I will go straight to introduce our next speaker, Sarah Esni Cohen. Sarah represents a new generation of Zionist leaders in Israel, 
She's coming from a family with a long tradition of Zionist activism. Sarah started her, uh, her work young and is now the chairwoman of the My Israel Movement, a right-wing movement that has over 150,000 active members defending Zionist values both within Israel and outside of Israel. On a personal level, I can say that me and Sarah went to university together. We sat close to each other in class, and even then, I was impressed by her unique combination of skills and values. Uh, this is the secret to her continued success, and I'm sure that her future is bright because of that. Sarah was born in Kirat Arba, near Hebron, which her family helped establish, and now lives with her husband, Elkanah, and their three children in Jerusalem. In 2016, Sarah won the Moskowitz Prize for New initiative, Initiatives. She is also a regular columnist in Israel Ayom, uh, Israel's largest newspaper. Sarah did a webinar with us at ZOA only a few days ago about the pogroms in Lod, and now we are partnering here on this program. We hope at ZOA that we will have many more opportunities to partner with you, Sarah. It is my honor to introduce Sarah Aitzni Cohen. Thank you. Tadao Ba. from and the hi, hello, shalom from Jerusalem. I'm very happy to be here. Dan, I have four children. <laughs> To fix you on this crucial fact, um, but thank you for all your warm words. It's really, it's really nice to hear. Um, thank you for, thank you everyone for for coming today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your kindness. Um, thank you, Morris. It was uh, really interesting to hear you once again. Thank you, Dan Iluz, your representative, uh, your really dedicated uh, representative in the, in in Israel. And thank you, Igal Dilmoni, the CEO of uh, Yesha Council, for this, you know, for this cooperation to raise this uh, event. Um, so, as Dan said, my name is Sarah Etnikoyan, and I'm the chairwoman of uh, My Israel Movement. We met a few, I think, a week ago, a week and a half ago. It was uh, really uh, nice to me. This, uh, I don't know if nice the nice is the word, but uh, it was really awakening uh, experience for me. Uh, to represent uh, and to present what happened here in Israel on May uh, to you guys. And uh, your comments afterwards in emails were really heartwarming. So the idea for this event, um, it, it came out uh, from a necessity. The COVID made the ocean wider. It made it bigger. It made the distance between us here in Israel and the, our brothers and sisters overseas, it made the distance so much larger. And we felt we need to connect. Um, so the idea to this virtual conference, virtual event in the issue of Judea and Samaria came out last year from out of the, the passion to keep in touch and to keep on talking and to keep on discussing these so the, the, the most burning issues here in, in the Zionist agenda today. So last year during three events, three Sundays, we spoke about Judea and Samaria, about the Avra, Abraham Accords and about different processes that happening here in the Middle East. After the great success of last year, we decided we must do it once again. So we're meeting this year again, uh, and we're happy to, to have you once again with us to three meetings. We're gonna have once again, three Sundays in order to talk about this so important issue of Judea and Samaria, about the importance of the Bible land, the unbelievable, so, sorry, the undeniable historical and religious implications of this area of Judea and Samaria. We're also going to talk about the great opportunity for the success, successful future of the state of Israel and the entire Middle East that this region, Judea and Samaria has. This is also the title of this, uh, this current event, but not the less important. We're gonna talk about the challenges and we have a lot of challenges today Crucial, in ch crucial challenges here in Judea and Samaria, um, security, but not only security, 
we have the challenge of the land. We have the challenge of, of how we save the Jewish archaeological sites that all, all around Judea and Samaria. We have a lot of challenges and we're happy to share them with you and to, to discuss them with you. We're very happy that you chose to come here today to this virtual event. And I pray that next year the COVID will pass and will disappear and we can meet together and we can have this event, this conference, not in a virtual um, way, but in a real conference, in a real life. So thank you very much and let's continue. Thank you so much, Sarah, uh, and sorry about the mistake, uh, but uh, thank you for your inspiring words, and I agree with you. We hope that we'll uh, do even more partnerships, and that next time we'll be not only virtually, but in person, both in the United States and here in Jerusalem, uh, where we both live. Uh, and now we will enter the second part of this uh, webinar. Uh, we will enter a series of TED-style talks, short 10-minute lectures from the very best speakers on subjects relating to Judea and Samaria. After the next four speakers, as I said in the beginning, we will also have an exclusive question and answer with the CEO of the Judea and Samaria Council. So stay tuned and wait for it. The next speaker is one of the most prominent politicians in the political scene today in Israel. Many people see him as an obvious choice for prime minister in the near future. Of course, ZOA is not political, but that's what many people say. Nir Parkat served as mayor of Jerusalem and completely revolutionized the city, bringing it from poverty and crisis after the second intifada back on the road to economic growth. Before entering politics, Barkat was one of the first high-tech innovators who turned Israel into the startup nation that it is today. He brings all of this business savvy, innovation, and creativity to his work as a politician and has created a plan for Judea and Samaria, which he will present to us today. It is my honor to give this great leader 10 minutes for the presentation of his plan. Nir, the floor is yours. Shalom to everyone from Jerusalem. I want to thank the Zionist Organization of America for uh, inviting me to speak today. I want to greet Congressman Louis Gohmert and thank Mort Klein, my dear friend, president of the COA. I want to again greet Sarah Hayetzni Cohen uh, from My Israel and Igal Dilmoni, the CEO of Moetzet Yesha, and Dan Iluz, the Israel director of ZOA, so allow me to share my vision for Judea and Samaria with you and focus on the economic side. In my last trips to the United States, I met many senators, both from the Republican side and the Democratic side, focusing on win-win ideas to improve quality of life for both Israelis and Palestinians. Now, there's no doubt in my mind and my experience as the mayor of Jerusalem, the, the better the economy, the more prosperity. The more prosperity, there's more security. And I showed basically two pictures. One is Gaza and the Hamas in Gaza. Do we want to be like Gaza or Taliban in Afghanistan? Or do we want to create a relationship with Dubai, with the Arab United Emirates? Um, I believe that's the right model to focus on and this is the kind of neighbor we want to see develop. So the idea is to look at the ways to improve quality of life for the Arab, Arab residents of Judea and Samaria side by side to the Israelis. Now, my experience as mayor of Jerusalem is exactly that. How to improve via economy through better jobs, through better economy for the city, how do we improve the uh, uh, ability for more Arab uh, men and women to join the labor force, to improve their uh, wages, and so that together that translates to more security, that translates to better quality of life. It mediates the tension, and it is certainly something that is not questionable on the Israeli side. So what I did is uh, 
I seek to work with Professor Michael Porter from Harvard Business School and created teams, one focusing on economic growth for the Galil, one for the Negev, and one focusing on how to improve the economy of Judea and Samaria. I want to share some fascinating number with you. The average wage of an Israeli is over $50,000 a year. We've dramatically improved in the last decade. Arab Israelis is over $35,000 a year. The Palestinians that cross the fence every day, there's about 100,000 of those, $16,000 a year. The Palestinians working with Israelis in Judea and Samaria, in areas like Barkan and Ariel, is $11,000 a year. In Nablus, in Shechem, in Ramallah, in areas A and B, it's about $7,000 a year. And in Gaza, $3,000 a year. The point I'm making is that the more the Arabs cooperate with the Jewish state on the economic side, the better off their position is. And directly associated with that is where there's more cooperation, there's more security. So there's no doubt that we must seek how to create joint ventures between Israelis and Palestinians. So the first area, what we call a business cluster, Judea and Samaria has a huge competitive advantage, is if you go to areas like Barkan and Ariel, these are industrial zones, um, that is a classic joint venture between Israelis and Palestinians. The Israelis bring to the table um, technology, entrepreneurship, capital, management. On the other side, there's relatively very cheap land and the labor cost is relatively lower than in other places. Uh, that combination brings a lot of industry and the jobs there are much, much better for both Israelis and Palestinians than alternatives, which is something I believe we should always challenge and give the people uh, opportunities to scale, to management, quality of jobs, of course, and to better education. Today there are 15,000 Israelis and about 25,000 uh, Palestinians working together is in these zones. And what we've done in our plan is dramatically expand that. Um, we've proposed 10 times more uh, industrial zones that are sitting in Area C, secured by Israeli army uh, and enabling not just 250 or 40,000 people today, but half a million employees partially Israelis and partly, partially Palestinians, working together in harmony in the next 30 years. The second economic driver has to do with tourism. We've looked at Shiloh. Shiloh is a biblical site where the tabernacles rested for 360 plus years since our great ancestors moved in back from Egypt until the city of Jerusalem was built. That site is, is being developed very wisely and enjoys over 40,000 evangelicals that come every year to see the story of the Bible. Therefore, what we've done is created an array of 24 biblical, beautiful stories. Um, and we're going to develop sites, biblical sites, that tell the story of the Bible. For example, if you go to Bethel, that is on that little hill is where Jacob had his dream. But currently, there's no ladder there. We're not, we have not created a site that will tell the story of Jacob's dream. Similarly, where David, King David wrote Psalms in the southern part of the Hebron Mountains. So if you add all these stories together, we could market the land of the Bible that uh, shows people where the Bible actually happened. It's a huge advantage, has huge potential all over the world. And we'll also share with the world who really owns the land of the Bible, the land of Israel. That translates to a lot of better economy, more jobs, classic win-win. I want to add another dimension which I believe will dramatically improve quality of life, and that is very strong road systems that will decrease the tension between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, there, you create a system that optimizes quality of life for Palestinians. And the second complementary system optimizes the life of Israelis. We mesh them together to one system. 
And by the way, the Palestinians ride on both. Only Israelis are limited because of security to use the Palestinian system. But from my perspective, this is improving quality of life and decreasing tensions, which is a classic win-win relationship in Judean scenario. The next point I want to raise is how do we scale living together side by side? And I prepared a plan with my friends in Kohelet and Forum Shiloh, a plan of how to scale. And if you look into the future 30 years ahead, how do we fit 2 million Israelis in less than 10% of the land of Judea and Samaria? That means that we have to apply zoning codes accepted in the West, in the United States, in Europe. You have to go high. You, uh, I have a lot of experience doing that in, in Yerushalayim. And in a symmetrical way, demand the same from the Palestinians. They cannot build anywhere they want. They cannot go and build uh, in uh, national parks, like in the uh, Judean desert and other places, which unfortunately they're doing today. Imagine for a second that people build in the heart of the Grand Canyon or in Central Park in New York. Nobody will ever accept people with no zoning code. And so, by example, we've demonstrated how we could fit 2 million Israelis in less than 10% of the land in the next 30 years. We're currently about a half a million Israelis. And in a similar way, we, anticipate, we expect the Palestinians to respect the land of the Bible. So if you add all these things up, there's boosting the economy through industrial zones. And boosting the economy and tourism through the tourism land of the Bible. You create a network of roads that optimize quality of life. So if I have to wrap up my vision, it is looking into the future uh, and focusing on how we live side by side next to each other, how Israelis and Palestinians can develop side by side, not one on the account of the other. We must always have full security in the hands of the IDF. But one thing that will dramatically improve the quality of life is a joint economy and recognizing that nobody's going anywhere. And so through industrial zones and through tourism and other methods, there's no doubt in my mind that that fits the model that we want to look into the future. I would like to see the Palestinians develop to becoming the Dubai of the world and not Hamas of the world. That is the path we must take. Thank you, Neil. <clears throat> Thank you, Neil. What a fascinating talk. Uh, ZOA definitely supports sovereignty in Judea and Samaria, and we hope your efforts towards that bear fruits. Our next speaker is a good friend of mine, former Minister of Regional Cooperation, Ophir Akunis. Ophir started his path in politics as a spokesperson for Netanyahu and has since been loyal to right-wing values. He is one of the biggest defenders of sovereignty in Judea and Samaria, and, and, and as Minister of Regional Cooperation was key to the strategic shift focusing on regional peace rather than letting the Palestinians have a veto power on Israel's international relations. Today, he has the Ab Abraham Accords Caucus in the Knesset as an in, and, and is in touch with leaders around the world to promote this perspective. Ophir, I am honored to give you the microphone. Hello and good morning to all my friends in New York and ZOA members and friends uh, for your summit today. Uh, this is Ophir Akunis from uh, the Knesset in Jerusalem, uh, former Minister of Science and Technology and the Regional Cooperation. And I uh, would like to say a few uh, words uh, from here, from Jerusalem, to you in the United States, States these days according to, uh, to the uh, peace process uh, between us and Emirates, uh, Bahrain and Morocco and the Abraham Accords and the future of Judea and Samaria. I want to start with Judea and Samaria and I want to say that I'm very, very, very worried about the future of Judea and Samaria and why I'm worried. Not because I changed my mind. As you know and some of you already heard me in your offices in, uh, in New York, I will stand very strong against the idea of two-state solution and the idea of a Palestine, a, a, a Palestinian, a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria. Why? First of all, uh, we, we talked about it. 
This is our right. You can see on my desk here in the Knesset, in the Israeli parliament, the Bible. And this is our homeland, Judea, Samaria, and our eternal capital, Jerusalem. The place that I'm talking with you right now is our homeland. And I don't know any other uh, nation around the, the, the world that want to uh, uh, give or to um, move their homeland to others. In this case, uh, usually the Palestinian enemy. I know that we uh, signed the Oslo Agreement and uh, other agreements with them, but we are still in a situation that they want to destroy Israel. And they don't only want us to, uh, to uh, withdraw from Judea and Samaria, the Golan Heights and Jerusalem. And we are building in Judea and Samaria lovely cities such as Ariel, Maale Domim, uh, Emmanuel, and uh, others, Gush Etzion, of course, and the other settlements. And I'm not saying settlements as a, as a, as a bad word. It's as, as a settlement, a Jewish settlement in our homeland, like Tel Aviv. It's also a settlement in Israel. And Haifa and the others, Be'er Sheva, Elat, and the others. Uh, we have already a university in Judea and Samaria, and I'm very proud that I was a minister in charge uh, as a minister of science and technology uh, that uh, work to change the agreements between the United States and Israel, agreements which signed in 1972. Uh, and uh, the agreements limited the, um, the American uh, um, involvement in science and technology uh, actually until what they called the 67 lines. Now they can uh, um, involve in um, innovation, science, technology, and high tech, uh, and cooperate with Ariel University and with other universities like, such as uh, Shamir Institute in the Golan Heights. And this is, I think, a very, uh, very uh, huge change in the relationship between United States and America, and that was for good. But why am I worried? because I think that the current government in Israel is for a Palestinian state. You can, you can hear the um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Lapid, the Minister of Defense, Guns, and of course Meretz and Labor, and uh, they are saying all the time that they are for a Palestinian state in Judea and Samaria. And from the other side, I can't hear ministers from what they call, they call themselves, the right-wing ministers such as Saar, Elkin, and others, that, and Bennett and Shaked, that are saying that they, are, they will be against the idea of a Palestinian state. Lately, the Minister of uh, Defense, and uh, right after, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, invited senior Palestinians to their, to their residence in Ramat Aviv, in Tel Aviv, or in Rosh Hashanah, nearby Petah Tikva, to their private residence. They did not talk about anything else, uh, as far as I know, uh, unless they talk about the idea of uh, establish a Palestinian state. We are in the opposition, headed by Prime Minister Netanyahu. We stand very strong, as I said, against the idea. It's a dangerous idea, because they can use rockets, and they can uh, uh, build tunnels from uh, Kalkilia to Kfar Saba and from Tulkarem to Natania and even from Hebron to Be'er Sheva like they, they, are, they did in Gaza, we stopped it as you know of course but this is very dangerous also to Afula and to the Emek from the other side uh, because the hills uh, uh, above Judea and Samaria and of course the, jo the Jordan Valley uh, this is not only our homeland, this is uh, strategic uh, territories for the state of Israel in Gush Dan, here in Jerusalem, in the north or in the south. Uh, the second uh, thing uh, that I want to talk with you is the Abraham Accords. As you know, I established the caucus uh, here in the Knesset and I'm co-chair of uh, uh, the lobby for uh, the caucus for Abraham Agreements. This is... Uh, a very very important agreements these are very very important agreements with um, Muslim countries that did not say to us that we need to uh, sign agreements with the Palestinians before they will sign uh, agreements with Israel they signed the agreements with Israel even though 
that nothing new happened with the Palestinians in the, in the, in the last uh, uh, decade. So we don't need the Palestinians to move on with the relationship with Muslim countries around the world. And it's very good for our economy. Why is that? Because they want, and they told me, uh, their ambassadors and ministers that I talked over the phone or meet me here, um, used to, uh, as, uh, saw me in the Ministry of uh, Regional Cooperation in Jerusalem or in other places in Jerusalem or in Tel Aviv. They said, we want to collaborate, we want to cooperate with Israel uh, in the fields of high tech, water tech, uh, agri tech, and uh, uh, a lot of innovation uh, um, ideas that we know, that what they said, that you can do it. You know, this is an album. Israeli discoveries and development that influenced the world, published by the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology during the days that I, as I said, uh, um, served as the Minister of Science and Technology in Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, cabinet between 2015 and 2020. Yeah, uh, two, yeah that's right. Five years. <laughs> and uh, they saw these things. These satellites, the robots, even the cherry tomatoes. They know that we are a powerhouse of innovation. And they want us to be involved there in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, in, uh, in, uh, in Bahrain, in Morocco, and even in Sudan. And I want to tell you another thing. I suppose that in the future all of you will hear about another, another Muslim countries that want to um, uh, uh, declare uh, that they want a, a relationship between them and the state of Israel. So I think that it's a, a really engine to the Israeli uh, economy, uh, uh, even the uh, universities, in, uh, such as Ariel University, or, or as I said, uh, um, the institute in the Golan Heights, in uh, its Shamir Institute, uh, and uh, all of us, including the wine of Samaria, including the wine of Judea, and, uh, and the other agriculture and the agri-tech that came from Judea and Samaria is good from there. It's good for them, and they, and they don't want to limit the, the Israeli, uh, let's say, um, the Israeli uh, uh, innovation only to the 67 lines. They know that in Judea and Samaria there's a lot, there are a lot of initiatives that they want to cooperate with. And I know that one of uh, my friends, uh, Yossi Dagan, already traveled. Uh, to the Emirates and started uh, start to uh, negotiate about economic relations between uh, the Emirates and not only Israel, Judea and Samaria, and Samaria because he's the head of Samaria, as we all know, and they want to cooperate and collaborate with him and uh, with his municipality as well. So this is a huge future to all of us, to Judea, to Samaria, uh, to the state of Israel, uh, to, do, um, uh, to the Persian Gulf countries, and uh, we are welcome them, and I want you uh, to know that this is uh, really a huge success of the previous government, I think by Netanyahu, as I said, the signing and the peace treaties between uh, Israel and Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and uh, Sudan as well, and the other countries that will follow. So I want to send my, um, my wishes to all of you, and I hope that maybe around the events in um, New York, in the end of May, the Parade for Israel, maybe we'll meet again in your offices there in uh, Manhattan, in the United States. Uh, from now, from Jerusalem, I want to tell you that I'm very, I appreciate your support to Israel and you always welcome here in our country, in our homeland, and here in the Knesset in Jerusalem. Thank you, Ophir. Wow. The world speaks of Jewish sovereignty in Judea and Samaria as an obstacle to peace, but the facts on the ground, the way we've heard them today, show that Jewish sovereignty in Judea and Samaria is actually the key to peace. Now, I want to remind everyone that at the end of today's program, we'll have a questions and answers uh, with the CEO of the Judea and Samaria Council, the Yesha Council, Igal Dilmoni. Uh, write your questions either in the question and answers uh, section of, uh, of Zoom or in the chat, and that way I will be able to communicate them to Yigal. Our next speaker is a great friend of the Jewish people, 
without himself being Jewish. Louis Gohmert is an American attorney, politician, and former jurist serving since 2005 as the US representative from the Texas First Con Congressional District. During his time in Congress, he has been a steadfast supporter of Israel and of sovereignty in Judea and Samaria. He is a member of the Israel Allies Caucus. As EOA Israel's representative, I have to tell you that this support from non-Jewish friends is incredibly significant, not only outside of Israel, but also inside of Israel, as it shows Israelis that they have the leeway to make the right decisions without worrying too much about international pressure. So Congressman Gomert, before giving you the opportunity to talk, I want to, as an Israeli, deeply thank you for your support. It is my honor to present Congressman Louis Gomer. Hi, I'm Louis Gomert, American member of Congress, and pleased to be talking with you today about the nation of Israel. It's a good thing that the United States supports Israel, blesses Israel, considers Israel a very dear and abiding friend, a nation where democratic principles of a republic actually exist in the Middle East. A true ally. If we had to build an outpost, a fortress to keep ourselves safe, we could not afford to have a better fortress, a better place of security than Israel itself. But historically, when you look at Israel, there's no one in the land currently who pre-existed Israel's ownership of the land now occupies, that it now lives in, that it's now its home as it was thousands of years ago. And if you go back to the days of King Saul, over a thousand years before what we would call BC, you see that the tribes that were there no longer exist. And you look at Judea and Samaria, a marvelous part of Israel. Israel can't defend itself without having that as part of the Israeli state. And if you do go back to the time of King Saul, as he was succeeded by King David, King David ruled for seven and a half years in Hebron. Hebron. And people are saying, oh no, that's not ever part of Israel. It's where King David ruled for the first seven and a half years of his 40 years as king. And Shiloh, Shiloh, where the tabernacle was, I mean, I, I've stood there and I've seen where the walls were and the Holy of Holies and where the Ark was, the Ark of the Covenant. How could that not be part of Israel? How could it not be a prior claim? Judea and Samaria, you look at Hebron, where David's father was buried, when you look at where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their wives were buried, but especially going back to King David, ruling initially there, then later for the next 33 years ruling from Jerusalem. You take away Judea and Samaria, I mean, basically Israel is indefensible. And that's what many people want. Now, as a believer of the Bible, including uh, the Old Testament, Tanakh, um, the book of Joel, God 
uses the, the prophet Joel to explain that when Israel has come back into possession of that land, its land, including Judea and Samaria, that God is going to bring down judgment upon those who, as it says, divided up the land. I'd rather not be a leader in a country or be even existence, <laughs> existing in a country where God is going to bring down judgment because that country divided up the Israeli land. Yes, that's where Israel and Judah were ruled over. Why would we divide that? If it remains part of the state of Israel, then everyone therein, Arab, Jew, whomever, you get to participate in the government. You get to vote. You have security. Take away Judea and Samaria. It's not a safe place. We've already seen that. It's been tried and it's true. Judea and Samaria should be, are, and should always be part of Israel. You look at Shechem where Joseph was buried, there's just extraordinary ties there that make very clear this is and should be part of the nation of Israel. Our friend Israel, some compare to the miner's canary, that if there is an attack on Israel, the next will be an attack on the United States of America. But I would also submit that the reverse is true. If there's an attack on the United States of America, next will be on the nation of Israel. I think we're that related and that much drawn together in principle and in purpose. So it is very serious to me, a person as I am that's taken an oath to support and defend the United States Constitution, I'm devoted to the United States. And I think the safest thing we can do for the United States is to be the best friend Israel ever had and that Israel has and make sure that its land is not divided up so we don't invite the judgment of God upon our nation. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray for the peace of Israel, and I pray that the United States will never do anything that harms that peace, that weakens Israel, or that divides up the land, thus bringing judgment down upon our nation. Thanks for listening. God bless you. Thank you so much, Congressman Gomert. Uh, the alliance between the United States and Israel is incredibly important to Israel. And as I said, these words are also important to me personally uh, as an Israeli. Our next and last speaker, before the exclusive question and answer with the CEO of the Judea and Samaria Council, is Dr. Yechiel Leiter. Dr. Leiter will also stay for the questions and answers. So if you have questions for him as well, write them in the chat and he'll also uh, answer them later on. Dr. Yechiel Leiter is an Israeli historian of philosophy and also a public, public policy analyst. Leiter is a scholar of the Shilo, uh, at the Shiloh Policy Forum. He has served as Deputy Ge uh, Director General of Israel's Ministry of Education and as Chief of Staff to Benjamin Netanyahu at Israel's Ministry of Finance. Dr. Leiter, the floor is all yours for the next 10 minutes. 
Good evening to uh, my colleagues here in Israel and uh, to all the friends of ZOA and Yesha and uh, my Israel on the uh, West Bank of the Atlantic. Um, I almost feel that it's a sacrilege to follow uh, Representative Gomer. Uh, his remarks are simply remarkable uh, to hear a lesson on the prophet Joel uh, from uh, an American US representative regarding Israel and Judea and Samaria is simply remarkable. And I think we should cherish the moment. Um, I would hope that uh, Representative Gomert's remarks are, are taped and uh, recorded and shared with uh, many, many thousands of people who are not, uh, are not privileged to be part of this webinar this evening. Um, listening to the speakers from the very beginning was very uh, nostalgic for me, and I must say very rewarding. Uh, ever since coming on Aliyah in 1978, I've lived in uh, either Judea or Samaria. I came on Aliyah to Kirat Arba and to Hebron. And uh, I go back with more Klein, uh, say almost uh, 35 years when I represented Hebron and spoke in Philadelphia. And Mort was then not yet the president of ZOA, but he uh, came forward in questions and answers, introduced himself. We've remained friends for many years uh, since. And to hear uh, the passion of uh, Sarah Hetznikon uh, as well is very rewarding for me because back in my days in Hebron, uh, I spent uh, a good amount of time with her esteemed grandfather, who is really one of the pillars of the uh, settlement communities, Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. And uh, I remember the late night meetings, to the wee hours of the morning uh, with Elia Kim Hetzni and many of the other leaders uh, of Hebron, Kiat and of Yesha as a whole, as to how to contend with uh, an ongoing situation uh, of trying to rebuild the Jewish communities in our ancient homeland. I say it's rewarding because at that time, when I first met Mort and worked with Eliakim Metzli, how many were we? We were a few thousand. So if any of you out there have any doubts about the future, let me tell you that when we started this business five, four or five decades ago, uh, it was uh, almost, almost hopeless. And today, uh, 500,000 Jews make Judea and Samaria uh, their home. What I'd like to talk about this evening are three short points with regard to what we can do positively now, short of sovereignty. Of course, we need sovereignty. And thank God the Trump administration and the last Netanyahu government put it on the agenda. It wasn't accomplished. It is the first time where governments actually spoke about sovereignty on the table. How much is not the issue right now, but that it became a real focal point of the US government and the Israeli government is of tremendous significance. And I think that in the years to come, we'll understand just how significant it is. With that, and before I get to the three points, I do want to say that talking about infrastructure and economics and housing, does not detract one iota from the security issue. What Representative Gomer said is 100% correct. There is no security for Israel without Judea and Samaria, period. Any generals who you hear who repeat ad nauseum, you know, in an age of missiles, we don't need territory, et cetera, they're not speaking security. They're not speaking from a strategic point of view. They're speaking from a political point of view. And when it comes to politics, ex-generals have no advantage over anyone else. As a matter of fact, when Ehud Barak was at Camp David and uh, he had decided that he was going to give up Judea and Samaria for all intents and purposes, other than 3%, what he called settlement blocks for 3% of the entire territory, he uh, called the chief of staff and he said, prepare, have the planning commission in the army prepare a plan for defending Israel without Judea and Samaria. And the response was, tell the prime minister then, Ehud Barak, that that's an impossibility, can't be done. And Barak's response was, tell my generals not to be political. And they answered him, no, no, no. We're giving you the strategic response. You're being political. And all one has to do is look back at the Gaza war that we experienced uh, almost a year ago. Imagine that the 5,000 missiles that were sh fired into 
Sderot and Ashkelon and Ashdod are now on the hilltops of Judea and Samaria. And they're focused to Greater Tel Aviv, which uh, houses 70% uh, of our industry, 60% of our population, where the entire banking industry uh, uh, exists, where the offices of the chief of staff are located, where our two ports are. One just has to go back to 1948 and remember why David Ben-Gurion insisted on two ports, one in Haifa and one in Ashdod. He said, because if one is captured and cut off, we'll have the other port available so we won't be completely uh, uh, isolated. So security is the number one issue and our rights, the rights of the Jewish people. Let's not be embarrassed to say that Jewish people have rights to the land of Israel. You know, the whole issue of virtual, uh, virtual Zionism is very much what our, our detractors would like, that we don't just have virtual, virtual webinars, but that Judaism be virtual, not real. Zionism be virtual. Don't really have to do anything about it. Just, just keep it as an idea, right? Security, virtual. We don't believe in virtual Judaism. We don't believe in virtual Zionism. We don't believe in virtual security. But I wanna make three points so that we can really uh, focus on them. And uh, I think if we do, we'll be able to turn things around uh, dramatically. It's not enough to talk about the illegal Palestinian encroachment of our territory in Area C. We can act now in Area C, even under the context of this government, uh, which is uh, a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a lot of nothing, unfortunately. There's still very, very much we can do. And we have to first change our concept of things. Ideas have consequences. And we have to change our ideas. Number one, planning for central Israel does not include Judea and Samaria. So when all the committees in all the government offices consider Hulon to Ranana with Tel Aviv in the middle, we're talking about a very narrow strip of land between nine and 15 miles. So that's the center of the country, which means that uh, real estate prices are sky high. It means that people can't build. It means that people can't sell. It means that there's very little room for uh, ecological considerations. It means that the country is very, very narrow. It, ha it results in many, many problems that are of a demographic and completely domestic uh, plane. The first thing we have to do is understand that the center of the country must be planned, including Judea and Samaria. That means that tomorrow we can build between uh, Rosh Ayan, which right now is the border, okay, which is the Eastern border, of, of, uh, of pre-67 Israel, which is on the green line. If we were to build from Rosh Ayan to Ariel, anybody takes a look at the map, sees that Ariel is smack in the middle of the country. If we look conceptually from the Mediterranean to the Jordan. So once we conceptualize the center of the country as the, as the belly, if we were to look at the map of Israel as a, as a body, Tel Aviv area, is the waistline. Everybody wants a narrow waist, right? But not that narrow, not nine miles wide. So from the Mediterranean to the Jordan, which is 40 miles, even if we don't go down to the Jordan Valley, just go to Ariel at the center of the country, we can build tomorrow between 70 and 80,000 housing units, which would be home to another half a million Jews in the center of the country. Okay, that's the first conceptual change we need to make in all across government offices, in all the ministries, in all the committees that deal with long-term planning for uh, uh, the country. The second conceptual change we need to make is planning inside of Yesha itself. And these two uh, 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 planning uh, planes, these two planning levels uh, operate on completely different levels. There's planning in pre-67 Israel and planning for Yeshua, that has to change. We have to uh, conceptually plan the center of the country, as I said, the first uh, point. The second point is that when planning is done inside of Yesha itself, uh, conceptually, we plan for the uh, expansion of Yeshuvim 
in the context of each settlement, the context of each community. What we have to do is change that. In between the issue of him, those of you who know, for example, let's take uh, Ariel, we mentioned Ariel, let's take Ariel, Shiloh, Eli, all nearby, um, Tapuach, okay, Barkan. Between those communities, there are state lands right now being encroached upon illegally by the Palestinian Authority. Okay, part of the reason why they're being encroached upon is because we have not put them into a planning context. So if we saw Ariel not at the boundaries of its fence, but all the area from Ariel to Eli and from Eli to Beit El and from Beit El to Ufra. So we draw a circle around this entire area, which would ultimately be included in the planning stages for uh, the Jewish communities of Judea and Samaria. What that would mean in effect is that instead of the 750,000 Jews planned, according to government statistics, by 2040, we can, by this conceptual change, bring that number to 2 million by 2050. The plans are there. The conceptual change is there. Now it just has to be adopted. And for my last point, the third point with regard to conceptual change, uh, which can dramatically not only affect a pre-67 Israel, sovereign Israel, and the not yet sovereign parts of Judea and Samaria, and that's infrastructure. Today, when planning is done, there are roads in Judea, there are roads in Samaria, and there are roads in Greater Tel Aviv, and there are roads in the Galil, roads in the Negev. We don't think in terms of a national infrastructure network, <clears throat> excuse me, a national infrastructure network that will service not the 10 million that live uh, in Israel, 10 million Jews that live in Israel now, plus uh, the, the uh, Palestinian communities, plus uh, the, the uh, Arabs of Israel. Uh, we need to think in much broader terms. And um, uh, the, the, the key to a national infrastructure that will revolutionize Israel, remember Israel sits at the intersection of the three great, great continents of Asia, Africa, and Europe. There's a reason why the silk trade in ancient history ran through Israel. Okay, we are at the crossroads of everything that's taking place uh, in, in, uh, in, in not only in this region, but really all over the world. And the Abraham Accords is just one example that allows us now functionally, not virtually, but functionally, to connect the Mediterranean with the Gulf. Okay, this could only be a pipe dream years ago. It was only conceptual. Now it can become functional. The infrastructure we need to focus on is what's called cross-border infrastructure. Cross-border infrastructure is a concept where a corridor is created, where we're not just talking about highway, a multi-lane highway for fast uh, transit, but along this corridor, there's also rail tracks, which will service both cargo rail and uh, uh, personal and, and, and people rail and the transport of a passenger, passenger rail. But along the highway, the passenger rail, the cargo rail are all of the uh, utilities, all relevant utilities, electricity cables, uh, natural gas, um, water, okay? That's been uh, desalinated from the Mediterranean, for example, which can go straight through this corridor to the Persian Gulf and service all along the way the parched areas of Jordan, terribly parched areas of rural Saudi Arabia, okay, as it makes its way to the Gulf. On the other way, on the other hand, right, in the other direction, we can have oil piped from the Gulf directly to the Mediterranean and avoid the problems we may have with shipping throughout the Gulf and um, uh, the, the shipping lanes, which certainly if we fall to Iranian domination, we're gonna have serious problems with them. This would avoid the uh, problems of Syrian, uh, Iranian domination in the Middle East. So these are three short conceptual changes that we can begin to implement uh, tomorrow. We can advance uh, tomorrow. And uh, again, I, um, I thank uh, the uh, sponsors for this uh, mega event. And uh, let's focus on just keeping the, um, 
uh, webinar virtual. But when it comes to our Zionism, let's make it very real and practical. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Leiter. Uh, we've seen today uh, through the different speakers how much potential there is in Judea and Samaria, the diplomatic potential, the economic potential, which also both of these issues were very clear in your lecture, Dr. Leiter, okay, sure. uh, and also uh, the potential for peace, the, the historical potential of connecting Israel with its rich history. Uh, and so now I will uh, ask my dear friend, the CEO of the Judea and Samaria Council to join us for Q&A. Uh, you, Yechiel, you should also stay. Uh, because some people might have questions for you as well. Igal Dilmoni is the CEO of the Yesha Council, the umbrella organization of all Israeli uh, communities in Judea and Samaria. And he has been in this position since 2019. Igal is married uh, and father of five. I hope I got this one right. <laughs> he lives in Avne Chefetz in the Samaria region. Uh, I met Igal as, I actually met Igal as a young Ole Hadash around 12 years ago when he was the vice president of the organization of the Yesha Council. And I was just starting my path as a new Israeli and also as an activist. And I remember how he inspired me by showing me that uh, the way to effective public service. If you remember when I spoke about Sarah Etzni, I spoke about someone that has a combination of strong values <laughs> and also incredible skills. So the same is true also about Yigal, and that obviously explains why he's so successful as his, at his job. So Yigal, before I start asking you the first question, maybe you can tell me in a few words, what, what did you think of the program today and why you think it was so important? Hello from Avnechefetz in the Shomron area, and thank you, Dan. All, the, all that event, you say thank you to everyone, but we have to say thank you for you, Dan, for all uh, for organization of all this all, of all that event. I think that this that event is very important because we hear a lot of lies as they are flowed all over the networks, the social networks, and people all over the world speak and say lie about Israel and about what's happened here in Judea and Samaria. Unfortunately, it's also Israelis people that from here that go to uh, Europe or go to states and say lies about Israel, about the IDF, about our government, about, uh, the, about uh, the people of uh, Judea and Samaria. So this, that event, we bring the, the true, we bring, we bring the, the, the right uh, uh, raw, uh, the right uh, situation, what's happened in the ground, we bring you to your people in states. So what you hear here uh, or you received in the email or in the, in the social media of uh, My Israel, of ZO, of Yasha Council, please don't, uh, don't read it for yourself. Please send it to everyone. Please tell people all over the world when you, people that you know, what you hear at that event and what you will hear at the next event. This is very important, uh, this program and also the next program that will be at the, the next uh, months. Thank you so much for your answer. Now I have a few questions that we got uh, throughout the, the event uh, through the chat uh, that was sent to the panelists. So uh, we heard a lot about the infrastructure in Judea and Samaria today, uh, especially from Nir Barkat and also from the last speaker, uh, Dr. Yechel Leiter. Uh, is there a master plan, something strategic that Israel has adopted for these infrastructures and for transportation in Judea and Samaria? Yes, first, I, maybe I, I will answer for some people that write question on the chat. I want to say something very strategic about the way that Yesha Council work. The Asia Council is the umbrella organization of 25, 24 council at the area. It's half million people, half million Israel that live at this area. We believe that we have the historical rights about this area. We believe that this area, Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley is belong to the Jewish nation. We are here not only for us, we are here for you, for people that, even the people that don't live here in Judea and Samaria, we keep the land and we develop the land. But together with this historical right, we have 
the responsibility to this area. We have the, the responsibility for uh, what's happened in this area, for all the people that live in the area. We have to keep people that have a good quality of life. We have to keep uh, people that will have a good road, a, a water, electricity, and other infrastructure. Uh, this is the right of, uh, of the Israel nation about this area is came together with responsibility. This is the way that Yesha Council work. And about the re re relationship between, between Israel, between Yesha Council and, and our government. Look, this government is not fit exactly in, in our dream. It's not what we dream about it. Uh, you know, Naftali Bennett, the prime minister now, uh, 10 years before he was the CEO of Yesha Council. It does, doesn't mean that this is where I will be in the next 10 years, but uh, but we, he, he have a government together with left, left, left people. And some of them are Arabs that uh, support uh, the terrorism. But the Yesha Council cannot stop working with the government to develop the area. We cannot say, oh, we don't like this government, we don't work and we don't, and we stop uh, 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 we start develop and build at this area. We have responsibility for hundreds of the generation that to, to take this land and, 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 and develop it for the future. At the last five years, we develop, and this is for your question, Dan, at the last five years, we uh, developed together, we planned with, together with the government, a master plan of, of roads and transportation, a master plan of water and a master plan of uh, electricity. And right now, as we speak here, there are uh, some big, big projects that in process that's working now at this area. I, I mentioned, I mentioned, I will mention now some of them. Uh, maybe you will know that we double the tunnels and the, um, and the bridge, double the bridge to Gush Etzion, from Jerusalem to Gush Etzion. And now we build an highway from Gush Etzion to Me'arat HaMachpelah to Hebron. And we build an highway from Tzomet Tapuach to Elon More and Har Bracha and all the area of Kever Yosef, people that know this area, what we call the Gavar. And we start to plan Road 60, the main road, the historical road, the, our, uh, the road of the Derech Avot, what we call it, from the, the time of the Tanakh. We start planning it uh, to be in a big highway. We start plan now road number 55 from Kfal Saba to Karne Shomron, Ve'aliza, and Kdumim to make it a highway. So now, when we speak now, there are some big projects that build at this area that connect this area and can help, like my friend Zichiel said, that can help people to live, to buy house, and to build their house and their family in our communities and can row and can drive to work in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem or at Kfar Saba or at Be'er uh, Be Sheva. Uh, and they can do it with a new road that we build. At the next five years, now this is our big mission to do, this is a big work that we work every day for it. Um, and then uh, this year, the government have to decide about the next five years, uh, the next project in infrastructure of roads for the next five years for all Israel, not only Judean and Samaritan, it's for all Israel. And we work together with the minister that we, that we know that they work together with us, like Ayla Chaked and like Matan Kahana and like Gidon Sar and the other minister and also with the prime minister, we work together to put this, uh, our road, our important road, uh, our uh, strategic road for the next five years in the budget, in, in the project, in the, pro in the program on the uh, process of uh, Israel. So I hope at the next years, like you say, that we will speak not at the Zoom, but at Jerusalem or in Manhattan or in Washington, that we will meet and see you face to face, I can say we have now a, a big, a, a, a more project all over the area. Thank you, Igal. I will ask you one more question, but before we do that, I wanna remind everyone that if you wanna join us for the next meetings, 
and then you have to sign up. I wrote the link in order to sign up uh, in the chat. The next meeting is going to be on February 20th. We have some very, very good speakers. The ambassador to the United Nations, Gilad Erdan. We have the minister of religious affairs, Matan Kahana. We have some very, very good speakers, Nadia Matar, for those who know her. Some very good speakers. The, the list of speakers is already on the website and you can already sign up. I suggest you do it right away. You might also get some emails in order to remind you uh, if you're part of the ZOA mailing list. Uh, that being said, I wanna ask you one last question, Igal, in order to close this, uh, this event. Uh, you spoke about the Israeli government and the difficulties with the Israeli government. Uh, what about the Biden administration? Has it been more difficult to develop Judea and Samaria since Biden took office? Um, we have to see what will happen at the next two months. Um, at the times of Trump administration, uh, every three months, four months, Israel approved a project uh, of building infrastructure of building in Judea and Samaria. And also at the, um, I think at it, the last time here was in November, the last November, uh, 2021, uh, in the time of in the um, in the time of Biden administration, Israel approved something like four thousand units um, in in Judea and Samaria. Um, so we have to wait for the next two months to see what will happen. But we are here believe we in Yesha Council believe that uh, we are in Israel country. We are states of Israel. I don't ask Biden even not Trump, if I can build in Judea and Samaria. I ask my government to build in Judea and Samaria. I ask my prime minister to uh, get a promote to build in Judea and Samaria. If prime minister want, or if you have, you know, you have uh, to do something together with the American uh, government and you have to ask them, this is his problem, it's not my problem. I don't ask Biden, I don't think that I have to ask anyone none from Europe and none of my, my big friends also in states, even if it's Trump or Biden or Bush or other guys. We are in our land. We are in Israel land. We are in the Jewish land. We have not, uh, have, we, we cannot, and we does not have to ask anyone if Jewish can build in Judea or if Jewish can live in Samaria or can build a house. This is our land. So what I, what Yesha Council do, we work in front of our government. We ask the promote from our government. If the, our government want to ask Biden or ask anyone else, this is the, the, the government problem. If our government will not give us to build, it, for us, it will be, uh, I don't know how to say it, it's a, it's, it's a red line that we cannot cross it. And I think the Biden administration know that at this government in Israel, you cannot stop the building in Judea and Samaria. And if Biden administration want to stop build in Judea and Samaria, he knows that this government can fell fell down, can fall, fall down. They will not government here in Israel, and we go to other election because the right people in the government cannot stop building Judea and Samaria. So this is our big issue now. We ask our government to build. And we, at the last two months, we have a promise. We have, uh, at last November, they give us a, a, a something like 4,000 units. And now we wait for the next time. And we work together with the government. We don't ask anyone to build in Judea and Samaria. Thank you so much, Igal. Uh, I want to thank everyone who was a part of this incredible event, the speakers, uh, starting with Mort Klein. Afterwards, Sarah Etzni, Nir Barkat, Ofira Kunis, uh, Louis Gomert, Congressman Louis Gomert, uh, Dr. Yechel Leiter, and uh, of course, Igal Dilmoni, who answered your questions. I also want to take a few seconds to thank the people behind the scenes that make this possible uh, Jacqueline Schaefer and Alan Jay from ZOA, Omer Alali, who is our tech person, who's making this look so beautiful. Uh, and also Dorit Schechter, who has worked very, very hard on this event. Uh, if you want to support ZOA, Yesha Council, or My Israel, I just uh, shared the links to our websites 
uh, in the chat. Uh, your uh, generous donations are what make the, these uh, events possible and they will be very much appreciated. Again, remember, sign up for the next meetings. Uh, they will happen on uh, February 20th and March 6th. Thank you very much for everyone who attended this event also.